Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Today we will go through the first chapter in the book, which is language, learning, and teaching. Apparently, learning a language doesn't happen overnight. It requires commitment, motivation, and some serious effort. This is why learning a second language will resulting in a new way of thinking, feeling, and acting. On top of that, learners also need to do their part in the journey of learning a second language as it involves social interaction on a meaningful context. So, moving on, what are the factors that influencing second language acquisition? There are seven of them. The first one is learner's characteristic. As a teacher, you need to know your students well. You need to know their cultural, ethnicity, and their religious background because all these three factors will affect their attitude on learning a second language. For example, a minority group learning the language of a majority group may have a different attitude or motivation while learning the language. Next, by knowing their socioeconomic status is also important as it affects sources to study and shape their views on second language. For example, Indonesian students in rural, rural areas have significantly less favorable views on second languages as they don't see it is as important, especially in terms of academic achievement. Next, native, language, native languages also give a huge impact on learning a second language as there will be some interference from first language to the target language. Next, life experiences will affect your student in learning a new language, especially if they have traumatic past events such as being scolded or laughed when using a broken English. Lastly, personality plays an important role in learning a second language. This is because it is believed that a shy and anxious learners will have a slower progress than the one that has high self-esteem in learning it. The next, fact, the next factor is linguistic factor. As a teacher, you need to understand that there will be some interference of mother tongue while learning a second language. So you need to identify what are the differences and the similarities from their native language and their second language. So does the language share the same alphabet or they have different alphabet like Mandarin language versus English? Or maybe they have different sentence pattern. For example, Japanese language versus English language. For example, in English, we will say, I eat rice. But in Japanese, we will say, eat rice, I. So, the next factor is learning process. Learning a second language involves effective factors, which is self-confidence, motivation to become a student that actively engage in the target language. As a teacher, you need to know what is your student learning style as it will help you to teach the language effectively. The next factor is age and acquisition. It is generally believed that children are better at language acquisition than adults. This is because critical period hypothesis proposed that in children development there is a period where language can be acquired or absorbed more easily than any other time. According to the theory, the critical period lasts until puberty and it due to biological development. The theory also adds that language learning may be more difficult after puberty because the brain lacks of ability and adaptation. Other researchers also prove that learners who start learning a foreign language as children achieve a more native-like accent than those who start as adolescents or adults. Next is classroom instruction. What is classroom instruction? It is type of activities that you will do with your learners while learning the target language. For example, lectures, seminars, question and answer. So you choose shock and talk or doing something interesting to capture their attention. Moving on, we have purpose. Purpose here is the motivation that drive your learners to learn the target language. Motivation can also be distinguished into intrinsic and extrinsic. 
Intrinsic motivation are the ones which there is no apparent reward except the activity itself. For example, you complete a task sheet because you love the topic or you want to improve yourself. While extremely, motiv extremely motivated behaviors expect a reward, for example, money, praise, or positive feedback from teachers. Next is context. Context here is the background knowledge. In other words, it is the glue that sticks information and learning together. Believe it or not, when you have some prior knowledge about a topic, you will understand it better when you start learning about it. So, remember, your student will learn effectively when the lesson is familiar with them or when you relate their existing knowledge with their new knowledge. So, when you're finding the answer about who is your student and what are the factors that are affecting their progress in learning the target language, you will decide that it depends, there's no specific answer, because it can vary from one learner to another, from one moment to another. Now, let's move on to the next part, which is the definition of language, learning, and teaching. The definition of language is broad and wide. So, um, Merriam-Webster um, defines language as a systematic means of communicating ideas uh, or feelings by the use of conventionalized sounds, signs, gesture, or marks having understood meaning. Um, however, Steven Pinker, in his book, The Language Instinct, he defined language as a complex specialized skill which develops in child spontaneously uh, without conscious effort or formal instruction and is deployed without awareness of its underlying logic. It is also um, qualitatively the same in every in individual and is distinct, distinct from uh, more general abilities to process information or behave intelligently. While Ron Scollin, 2004, he defines language as it's not something that comes um, in nicely packaged units and it is certainly multiplied, complex and a kaleidoscope um, phenomenon. So now that we already know what language means, let's break down the components of language into several parts. So first of all, language is systematic. What I mean by systematic is that it has codes where we use to communicate and use to convey our feelings. And then these symbols are primarily vocal but may also be visual and also written. So these symbols have conventionalized meanings to which they refer. So each symbol have different meanings. And then language is also used for communication as I've said before. And then language operates in um, speech community or culture. So each culture has their own um, language. Hence that particular language will only be spoken in that particular culture. And then uh, language is, is essentially human, although possibly not limited to humans. And then language is, is acquired by all people in much the same way. Um, language and language learning both have um, universal characteristic, meaning that no matter, oh, it, let's say if I learn English and you learn French, so you and I might chat the same way of learning both languages. So we pick up um, the language little by little and then pieces by pieces and form it as a whole. So with these eight statements provided, um, language has somehow um, opened up another field for linguists to study, such as the phonological, syntactic, lexical and also semantic, semantic analysis. And also um, we learn about the relationship between language and reality, such as its philosophy, its history, and then we also learn about phonetics, just like we learned last semester, previous semester, and then um, we learn about the psycholinguistic, which is the linguistic factor, the relationship between linguistic factor and also psychological aspects. We also learn about the communication system, how uh, the relationship between the speaker and the hearer interaction and then uh, how is the sentence processed from the speaker from the speaker to the hearer and also we learn about the dialectology field which I, I believe we had covered in the previous semester in um, sociolinguistic so we covered about language and culture 
Then we also covered, um, we also, the, the linguists also studied about the language universal, the first language acquisition and how um, we acquire our first language. So what is the definition of learning and teaching? So according to the contemporary dictionaries, they reveal that learning is actually acquiring or getting of knowledge of a subject or a skill uh, by studying it, experiencing it, or instruction. And educational psychologists, they define um, learning as even more succinctly as a change in an individual caused by experiences. So note that both of this um, definition of learning has the same key point which is experiencing so you learn by experiencing and then teaching uh, on the other hand is showing or helping someone to learn how to do something um, giving instructions um, guiding in the study of something and providing them with knowledge causing them to know or to understand a subject matter so now let's break down the components of the definition of learning, just like we did with language earlier. So learning is actually acquisition or getting a knowledge. And then learning is also a retention of information or a skill. And then the retention implies storage system, memory and cognitive organization. So eventually when we learn something, it will be uh, put uh, inside our memory system and we can easily retain it and then learning also involves an active participation conscious focus on and acting upon even outside or inside the organism so we are consciously and aware that we are present there and focus on learning the language it is different with acquiring where you acquire your mother tongue without you being conscious it's just it just happened that way but uh, learning is relatively permanent but subject to forgetting so you 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 can remember what you learn easily because it's permanent but you also um, tend to forget it as well and then learning also involves some sort some form of practice um, reinforced practice for an example when you learn other language other languages uh, besides your mother tongue and English such as Arabic, Japanese, Mandarin, your third language, you will somehow need a lot of uh, practices, uh, speaking practices in order to speak the language uh, fluently. And then learning is also a change in behavior. So this uh, concept has opened up into other subfields within the discipline of psychology, such as the acquisition processes perceptions, the memory storage system, the short and long term memory, the recall, the motivation, just like we learn in psychology, the conscious and subconscious learning, and then uh, learning styles uh, and strategies, the theory of forgetting something, reinforcement, and also the role of uh, practice. So now that we have learned what uh, learning means, it is now become very quickly becomes as complex as the definition of language earlier and then now we move on to the definition of teaching teaching is guiding and facilitating learning enabling the learners to learn setting the conditions for learning and understanding on how the learner learns so before this you've learned um, the seven key questions that you need to ask yourself and ask your learners in order to teach them language so that is how you understand your learner how your learner learns and then a theory of teaching is actually uh, the harmony of integrated understanding of the learner and the subject matter to be learned so when you combine this together you will develop a theory or your own theory of uh, teaching so now we will move on to the third subtopic in this chapter, which is the schools of thought in second language, second language acquisition. So if some of you don't know what schools of thought means, um, school of thought means a set of ideas or opinions that a group of people share about something, about a matter. It's basically perspectives. 
in the study of the second language acquisition, there are three um, schools of thought uh, that are prominent in this uh, in the study. The first one is the structural linguistic and the behavioral psychology. So these two comes together, and it is it was a theory that occurs during the forties and sixties. So what is structural linguistic? Structural came from the word structure, which means concrete, and then linguistic is the language. So together it formed concrete language. So basically, structural linguistics um, is defined as a study of language based on the theory that language is a structure system of formal units such as sentences and syntax. It is also called descriptive adequacy. So structural linguistics is basically the concrete um, language that we've seen written and we've spoken. For example, if I gave you the sentence, she eats a pizza. So you you already know that she is a pronoun, it is a verb, and then pizza is a noun. So all of this um, can be dismantled into pieces uh, and then it can also be add up and join again as a whole. So basically, it's, it's the mm, structure of the language that we've learned in the previous semester. So one of these structural, structural linguists, Freeman Twaddeley, he said, whatever our attitude to it, mind, spirit, soul, uh, as realities, we must agree that the scientists proceed as though there were no such thing, as though all his information were acquired through the processes of his physiological nervous system. So this means that a structure release belief that when we speak a language, uh, it has it has got nothing to do with our um, mind, body, and soul. It it, it is merely and only the language itself and then totally also said that uh, structure release examines uh, only overtly observable data and to ignore the mind in so far so you they observe the scene uh, structure the concrete one you they do not evaluate the in a, in a factor of us speaking the language, they do not evaluate the abstract thing inside our mind. Next, we move on to the behavioral psychology. So, behavioral psychology comes along with the structural linguistic earlier. So, behaviorism is a theory that was founded by B.F. Skinner. So, he believes that he study and, and analyze the observable behavior when we learn a language. So any notion of idea or meaning is explanatory fiction and that the speaker is merely the locus of verbal behavior and not the cause. So he observed um, the responses which can be objectively perceived, um, recorded and measured such as responses and stimuli. So uh, there are two concepts uh, that that are the domains of inquiry of this theory, which are consciousness and intuition. So uh, any failure on uh, gaining the consciousness and intuition, as in this uh, particular theory, will affect the result. And then uh, such example of behaviorism are the class classical and operant conditioning. I've attached a picture in the slide, as you can see. Uh, the differences between structuralism and behaviorism, although it came together. So structuralism basically we analyze the language and we identify the structure of the language bits by bits, pieces by pieces. And then behaviorism, on the other hand, have the habit formation. So if you want to correct a behavior, you do the positive reinforcement. If you want to incorrect the behavior, then you do the negative reinforcement. Basically, behaviorism is all about uh, observing the behavior of something or someone and how he, based on the language uh, produced by that person. Next, let's hop on to the 60s and the 80s. 
between 60s and the 80s. So in 60s and 80s, there are two theories that came together and formed. Um, those are generative linguistic and cognitive psychology. Next is generative linguistic. So generative linguistic is a theory founded by Noam Chomsky. He believes that human language cannot be examined simply in terms of observable similar and responses. So he objects behaviorism. He believes that there are something that um, triggers us to produce the language. He believes that humans are innate and born with LAD. LAD is language acquisition device. So this device, he believes that we are born with this device. Babies are born with this device. This device enables us to pick up the language easily from uh, surrounding our mom and dad when we were babies so having this device allow us to be able to acquire a language without having to learn uh, uh, to learn about it for a long term and then gener generative linguist was interested not only in describing the language itself as structure language but also in uh, in explanatory level of advocacy as well so he believes that there are something going on in our brain that allow us to uh, easily acquire a language another generative linguist Ferdinand de Souza I believe he's a French um, developed with uh, Perot and Long uh, theory so long is a composite of all the traits of language, the images and the words that come to mind and the sound to symbol connection and occurs when we speak. Uh, imagine a jar and then in this jar there are the traits of language, the images, the, the, the phonology, the syntax that we've learned, it's all in this jar. And then there come parole. Comes Perot. Perot is the act of activating long through the use of speech. Basically, it is the enabler of the long. So, this is the long, and then the Perot. We 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 use we use the traits of language in Perot. Perot is basically the speaking part. So, long embraces Perot, and Perot enabler is it is the enabler of the long. So the actual action that we engage in when we speak, as I'm doing right now, is essentially the parole. And then um, this has caused Noam Chomsky to develop his own theory based on the parole and law, he named, which he named competence and performance. Basically, the competence is just the same as long and the, for the performance is the, is the other name of parole. Uh, the theory that comes with the generative linguistic is the cognitive psychology. So, as all of us know, that cognitive relates well to our mind, brain, right? So, cognitive psychology is a study of the underlying uh, motivations and deeper structures, deeper structures of human behavior by using a rational approach. So, it employs the tools of logic, reasoning, extrapolation, and also inferencing in order to derive explanations from that particular human behavior and then uh, generative linguists and cognitive psychologists were more interested in more um, ultimate questions what underlying factors the innate the psychology the social environmental circumstances that cause a particular behavior in a human being um, let me make it simple it's basically when based on the book when somebody walk into your house and uh, fling a chair onto your window and broke the window. So, if we are, if we were talking about generative linguistic just now, right? So, generative linguistic basically just about what is the man's wearing, the size of the chair, the time of it happened, the accident happened, and then uh, did the window broke? Well, cognitive psychology. Um, is the uh, inner factors of what caused the man to fling the chair to the window. So maybe 
he stressed or maybe he he saw something that we didn't see so it is the why thing while generative linguistic is the what so what and why so next let's move on to the constructivism it is a theory um, form between the year 1980 and 2000 so it is a multidisciplinary approach so some of the founding fathers of constructivism are um, Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky. I believe all of you have heard this name. So um, constructivism is basically the integration of linguistic, psychological and sociological paradigms. So these three combine forming a theory called constructivism. So there are two branches of constructivism which are cognitive and also social. So the cognitive version of constructivism emphasizes emphasize on the uh, importance of learners to construct their own representation of reality. So uh, Piaget emphasized on this, which he believes the importance of individual cognitive development as a relatively solitary act meaning that we are responsible for our cognitive constructivism and then uh, it happened between the biological timetables and stages of development and social interactions uh, was claimed as to only trigger uh, the learners so it is solitary on us learning on our own we discover things as an active learners so another branch of so uh, of constructivism is the social constructivism. So social constructivism emphasizes on the importance of social interaction and cooperative learning in constructing both cognitive and emotional images of reality. So it focuses only on the individuals uh, engaging in social practices on a collaborative group. So uh, one of the theory that applies social constructivism is a uh, Lev Vygotsky theory which is a zone of proximal development that describes tasks as a learner has not yet learned but is capable of learning with an appropriate stimuli. So that CD is an important facet of social constructivism because it describes tasks that a child cannot do cannot do it alone yet but could do it with the assistance of more competent peers and adults. So the adults and the peers, collaborative peers, push them a bit so that they can learn by their own. There is also another um, social constructivist, which is Mikhail Bakhtin. He said that language is immersed in a social and cultural context uh, and its central function is to serve as medium of uh, communication so here a touch on the slide uh, is it are the three perspectives on second language acquisition or the three schools of thought in second language acquisition so uh, first is the structuralism and behavioral behaviorism and it occurs uh, from 40s to 60s and the typical things which is the key question or the key words are description observable performance empiricism scientific method conditioning and reinforcement and then generative linguistic or cognitive psychology uh, the keywords are acquisition the innateness uh, and then language competence uh, deep structure, interlanguage, systematicity, and variability. And then the last one, constructivism, uh, involves uh, keywords such as interactive discourse, social cultural factors, construction of identity, ZPD, cooperative learning, and discovery learning. I believe it's easier for you to remember these three theories by remembering the keywords and the time from 40s to 60s from 80s to 2000s and such in the western world 
Learning a foreign language always be associated with either Latin or Greek. This language is being taught in classical method. So, classical method focus on grammatical rules, memorization of vocabularies, grammar form, translation, and also performance of written exercises. This method has been adopted as a chief means for teaching foreign language, even though there is little to no thought was given to communicating or the oral use of the language. This is because a foreign language is being learned for the sake of being scholarly, for example, able to read or achieve the proficiency in reading a foreign language book. But there is no thought for the pronunciation. In the late of 19th century, classical method came to be known as grammar translation method. So the key features for grammar translation method are driven from classical method, which is heavy emphasis is put on grammar. It is taught in the mother tongue, much vocabulary is being taught in separate lists, reading of classical texts, they will do gra some grammatical analysis, drills in translation, and little to no attention to pronunciation. So the teacher will guide students through activities, and students need to be able to translate and recognize vocabulary, materials, include text in target language, and the relevant vocabulary, vocabulary list. It is so popular as the tests of grammar rules and translation are so easy to construct and score. Language teaching in the 20th century. As the saying goes that changing winds and shifting sands, language teaching tradition has been through tremendous change, especially throughout 20th century. This is because new methods are breaking from the old ones by taking some positive aspect of previous methods. So the trend across the decades are shifting focus on fluency versus accuracy, separation of skill versus integration of skills, and whether teacher need to teach teacher-centered way or learner-centered way. In the 20th century, we can see how audiolingual method is blooming in the 1940s and 1950s. Even though, of, uh, even though this method overemphasizes on oral production skill, but this method does not put equal emphasis on the four basic skills, such as listening, speaking, reading, and writing. This method is influenced by direct method, which is based on the Skinner's behavior, behaviorism theory, which human can be trained by positive and negative reinforces. But audiolingual method sprung from behavioral theories and is also reject grammar translation method. So some of the critics for ALM is advocating that more attention is being given to rules and cognitive code of the language. So therefore this language teaching is declined in the 1960s, 60s and also 1970s. So communicative language teaching, CLT, serve as a blend of previous method into the best of what teachers can provide in authentic uses of second language in the classroom. In this approach, students are given tasks to accomplish using the language instead of studying the language. Some of the features is CLT focus on meaning, fluency is the primary goal, it is a learner-centered, and also it focuses on communicative competence. Some of the differences between current language teaching practice versus now is the absence of proclaimed best method. Because one method can be too narrow and constrictive to apply to a wide range of learners or situation context. So as a teacher, you can choose any particular design or technique for teaching an L2 or second language in a specific context as every learner is unique. Thank you.